Delta, I don't mean as just a sim simple symbol saying like, oh, I'm perturbing it a little. This is, in its own right, a path perturbation operator, uh, which is a hell of a lot like a position differential, but uh, it's a position def uh, differential for the entire path for every instance of time. So we can, for example, talk about delta u, the path perturbation of u, which would be u of r plus delta r comma t minus u of r t. We can very well talk about that and to first order this is going to be right just grad u dot delta r. So we can very well talk about delta as an operator in its own right. It behaves for all intents and purposes like a position like a position differential. It is in fact as you can see more of a partial differential. It doesn't count into effect a change in time. But uh whatever. It's a position based differential in practice. Uh so we've got this idea of a path perturbation operator and we just got an equation which is very nice because part of it appears way back up there. Uh, so kind of the m most straightforward idea is to say what happens when I dot delta r into this equation? And I get ma dot delta r is equal to negative delta u plus fc dot delta r. Now generally constraint forces act perpendicularly to the state space. My example was, you know, du double pendulums where the state space being given is, you know, the force is perpendicular to that. Uh, so if delta r lies within the acceptable uh, states given by the constraints, then fc must be perpendicular to delta r, and we get this extra freebie that this goes to zero, as long as we just choose the delta r's to stay within the constraints of the problem. So uh, we've gotten two great simplifications. We've got the path perturbation of u, and we've got the elimination of the very complicated constraint force, which we didn't like. The only question is, how do we deal with this term? Well, uh, this term to me looks a lot like the uh, something that came up in the work energy theorem. As you know, the proof of the work energy theorem goes, you take the line integral of a force, you define that to be the work done by the force. You take the line integral of the force over some curve, and uh, you say, okay, by Newton's laws, this is ma, which I'll write dv dt, over the curve. And then you parameterize dr with respect to time. And so you say dr is really the velocity times a small instant in time. Uh, and how do you do this integral? Well, you integrate by parts, right? You uh, integrate this and differentiate this, and that'll give you mv, when that's integrated, times that, v, integrated along the boundary points of the curve, minus integral of m, integrate that, differentiate that, dot dv, dt, dt. And now you see, just looking at these components of the uh, equation, you can add this to both sides, and these two are really the same expression. So twice that equals mvv, and so you can just evaluate this directly as one-half mv squared evaluated at the boundaries of the curve. Uh, so the trick, the point is, the trick is you uh, integrate this by parts and something nice falls out of it. And uh, so that's my first, uh, my first thought when I see that. Now how do I get this integration by parts? Well, I have to be in a time integral. 
This isn't in a time integral, and again, delta is just a path perturbation operator. It, uh, it shouldn't be viewed as, you know, the differential kind of working from a straight an analogy from here to here. You don't want to integrate over delta. Uh, you want to integrate over time. So what we do is we integrate ma dot delta r uh, with respect to time. That's equal to negative delta integral. <coughs> Excuse me. Or integral of delta u with respect to time. <coughs> Got a bit of a cold. Uh, and the idea here is, again, this is really dv dt. I integrate that, I differentiate that. And what I get is mv dot dr minus the integral of mv dot... And now, remember, the path perturbation operator works a lot like a position differential. So you can just interchange it with the derivative, right? So you get dot delta v, dot delta dr dt. Integral dt equals integral, negative integral of delta u dt. And this is evaluated at the boundary points. Well, I can make one more uh, one more restraint on delta r, which is, I started at one in the example I was talking about before. I started at a definite point, I ended at a definite point. And the ideal curve went something like this, and I'm investigating variations that kind of go like that. Well, uh, the simplification I can make here is to say that delta r does not perturb the endpoints. In which case, this can only be non-zero if v goes to infinity, because delta r is zero at the endpoints. So, uh, since v going to infinity is non-physical, you get that this goes to zero, and this is just delta of one-half m v squared. So uh, this is actually delta k, and we get that negative integral delta k dt is equal to negative integral delta u dt. Uh, and so far, so good, right? Uh, we can even combine these two and use linearity properties to say that uh, delta of k minus u dt equals zero. And hey, look, delta is inside a time, time uh, integral. So we can pull delta out of that and say delta of integral k minus u is often called the Lagrangian and denoted with an L equals zero. So what I've proven is, on the path which it actually takes, small uh, deviations from that path do not perturb this integral, which is often called the action. This is usually called the least action principle, that uh, the action must be at a minimum with respect to path changes. The very beauty of this proof is, I haven't told you what coordinates I'm measuring anything in. I did it entirely with vectors, and delta is coordinate independent as well. So all of this is coordinate independent, which lets you use whatever coordinates you want to express the Lagrangian and the delta. Uh, in particular, there's wonderful formalisms involved using generalized coordinates. 